I've got a present, Christmas present for you guys, and I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, in this video, I'm going to walk you through how I picked my niche um, and how I would pick a niche if I was starting from scratch, basically. Uh, my name's Charlie, built and scale two companies, an agency scaled it to seven figures, and a coaching business which now does multi seven figures. Um, I know a lot about picking a niche. Um, I've helped hundreds of people pick their niches, and I've got a very specific framework and method that I use, and I'm really really excited to share it with you today. Um, so if you're basically wondering whether or not you're in the right niche, if you want to think about switching niche, if you want to actually pick a niche, this video is going to walk you through A to Z, how to make the decision and exactly what you should be looking for. I'm going to walk you through the best niches, the worst niches. We're going to use the framework basically. This video is actually from the second version of my paid program that isn't even released yet. Um, we're working on a brand new product which will be released towards the end of January. And I wanted to share this video with you as a sort of um, teaser specifically for that, but more importantly, to actually help you because truthfully, I just really want you to be successful. And a lot of people struggle with niche picking and becoming successful. And so I'm hoping that this video goes some way to help you do that. This is a present. I do not want to try and sell you anything. I haven't got a 997 course. There's no call to action in this video at all. Just enjoy it. And I hope you find it valuable. Happy Christmas. See you later. Hey everyone, Charlie Morgan here and welcome to Specialist Domination. Uh, in this video, we're going to be discussing niches and niche selection. Now, if you're watching this video and you're a member of Easy Grow, there's a strong chance you already have a niche defined and that's great. I'd still recommend you watch this video um, as the sort of exercises and action items that we use in this video will help you understand the next video, the next video, and so on and so forth. And these foundation videos are designed to be completed in linear format, so it's really important you watch them all. I know they're quite long, I know there's a lot of them, but I promise if you lay your foundations right and you learn to think, client acquisition will become really bloody easy. So in this video, I'm gonna basically explain like why you need a niche, I mean, it's pretty straightforward, you should already understand that, but I'm gonna explain why. I'm gonna talk a little about the operations of a business and how a niche influences that. We're gonna discuss the best niches, the worst niches, and I'm gonna give you an actual exercise to help you pick a niche if you haven't already done one. Maybe you feel like it's time for you to change niche. Uh, if that's the case, then I'd recommend you think before you do, because hopping niche is rarely the, um, the answer to your problems, but it can be a good option sometimes. So yeah, I've got a bunch of exercises, some action items to run through, extremely important video. What you have to recognize is that client acquisition, it, it, it revolves around humans, right? We need to convert a stranger into a client. And the better we understand that stranger, and the better we're able to specify them and conclude like who they are and what they want and you know how they fit into a small group of people, i.e. a niche, the better we understand them, the easier it is for us to tailor triggers and stimuli that encourage them to become clients, okay? We're gonna talk a lot about how to create offers, how to create ad copy, how to create all these things from scratch so that you can just basically be a, a complete powerhouse of acquisition. But it's important that you know you have a niche. So if you don't have one, then you need to watch this video. If you do have one, I'd still recommend you watch it. So let's get into it. So we're gonna start off by talking about functional roles and then operational drag multipliers specialists advantage, niche selection mistakes, the best niche, rowing the boat, niche selection checklist, niche market research, and um, I put offer power at the bottom there, that shouldn't actually be there, so that's my mistake, that's in the next video. So let's get into this. So I've got a Google Doc um, or a PDF that will be available in the resources section for download, um, so you can have a look through this one. You can have a read through it, but I'd still recommend you watch the video because we always cover intricacies that we don't on the doc. So welcome to Specialist Domination. In this video, we're going to explore niches and taking some action to help you find, define, and research a profitable niche. So if you do not have a niche, you need one, okay? If you don't have one, you need one. If you want to scale and you want to have a simple, easy to run business that's profitable, you need a niche. If you're currently generalized and want to niche down but not fire your existing clients, then what I'd recommend you do is pick a niche and grow your business in that direction. So an, a niche allows you to have intent, right? Because if you want to grow your company, you need to acquire clients. And you can't just acquire any old client. You need to be extremely intentional with like your messaging. Because if you want someone to buy from you, they need to feel like what they're buying from you is specifically for them, right? And in order to do that, you need to have a niche. You need to sort of explain like, okay, this is specifically for you. Otherwise, you're just kind of like, hoping that people wander around your business and maybe resonate with something that you offer. But I like to build companies and I recommend you do this. I like to start with the niche, right? And understanding what they want and what their problems are. And then I like to start by creating an offer, 
that basically solves that problem for them and gives them confidence that we are the company that can solve the problem. And then I produce all sorts of um, acquisition systems around that. And then I build my product based on that. So when you're figuring out your niche, it's important you recognize that you don't, you should not decide your niche based on your product and your current skill set, right? You should base your products and skill set around your niche, right? So you shouldn't, you should never build your business like to build a business. You should start with the market and you build the business around the market, right? You cannot build a market around a business, right? So you operate in a market whether you like it or not. And it's important that all of your business efforts are aligned with the needs and wants and desires and mechanisms of that market. So if you think like, okay, like I know how to do web design. I'm going to, that's what I do. That's what I sell. It's like, well, if you're going into a niche or a market and the market fundamentally doesn't want or need web design, then there's nothing, no amount of promotion you can do to build a successful web design company because you're just selling something you don't need. You're going against the grain, which isn't something smart to do, you know, in this instance. So it's really important. You start with the niche, you figure out what their problem is and what they want, and then you build a solution to basically alleviate that pain from that problem. And then you create an offer around that solution. And this is how business should be done. But a lot of people have it backwards. A lot of people try and build like they, they build the business first and then they try and build the market around the business. But you can't build a market. The market just is right. The best way to imagine this is that you are a organism trying to survive in an ecosystem. Right. If you were able to, you know, if you were going into an ecosystem and trying to settle into an environment, you would try and pick like a little niche or a role and carve a little piece out for yourself so you can live there and you've got like food and safety and protection so you can, you know, obviously thrive. It's the same thing in business, right? You don't get to choose the ecosystem. The ecosystem chooses you, right? And you need to be conducive to that ecosystem. Otherwise it will kill you, right? So there's a quote from Warren Buffett and it summarizes this whole thing really well. It doesn't matter how hard you row. It matters what boat you are in. So the, the, the whole point, it took me a long time to realize the power of this quote. Like if, if, this, if this quote hasn't quite hit you in the chest, you probably haven't sat with it for long enough. But you can be like, you could take someone that is extremely talented and able to produce a huge amount of value, right? For a specific thing. But if you put them in the wrong niche, or if you put them in a niche that doesn't want what they sell, it doesn't matter how hard they try and sell it, it won't sell. So the whole point Warren Buffett was trying to make here is like, if you're if you're in a rowing race, right, and you're on a boat, if you're in a boat that just is like super heavy and the oars are broken and like there's a leak in the bottom of it, it doesn't you can row as hard as you want. That boat will not win the race. And the same is true with niches. It's like a lot of people operate in niches that it's kind of like they're in a rowing race, right? But there's a massive leak in the bottom of their boat and they haven't got any oars, so they've just got one oar. <laughs> like it's, that's what you can liken it to. So it's a really important video. So functional roles. So in a natural ecosystem, all species play a functional role that contributes to the ecosystem as a whole, right? It's impossible for um, an organism or a species to inhabit a specific ecosystem without it playing a role, without it having a functional purpose that contributes to the overall success of that ecosystem, right? Without a functional role, the species is rendered useless to the ecosystem and is eradicated, right? This is why businesses fail, typically, right? If a business goes into a market, and it doesn't meet the needs of the market, or it doesn't have a functional role supporting the overall success of the market in some way or another, then it dies. And this is what happens with people who start generalist businesses, right? You know, if you go and do some, try and sell something online, or if you start like a, I don't know, like a marketing agency, or you try and become a coach, like you need to have like a really specific reason that you exist. You can't just be like, oh yeah, I just do business coaching. It's like, you're never going to get like, you know, there's a quote that says you can have anything, but you can't have everything. Okay. And that's kind of what this, this point is trying to make. And the same is true in business, right? But the market is the ecosystem and your business is an organism within a species. If you don't play a specific role in the market, or if you don't play it really well, the market will render you as useless, effectively chewing you up and spitting you out. So it's not just about like, playing a certain role and having a certain, you know, niche defined and carved out, it's about playing that role as best as you can, right? So I, for example, am in like the high ticket online business niche. And that, that's who people I work with are selling like, you know, retainers or coaching or courses. And they, they sell these high ticket products on a service basis, typically, or like a coaching basis. And like, there's lots of people in my niche. And there's lots of competitors that I, you know, compete with and people that try to get the same clients as me. But I'm a lot better at this than a lot of people. And that means that I get my lion, the lion's share of the market, right? So 
you can hop in and, you know, you can carve out a niche and it's going to give you an advantage, but you still need to play the role really, really fucking well. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're not really going to do anything, right? So in your market, focus is power, right? Specialists have authority and obviously authority is where you purchase from. And depth of expertise is everything and functionality is leverage. So if you want power, authority, expertise, and leverage, you need to just focus on one specific niche. Without a niche, you're aimless, and you cannot align your growth efforts in a tangible direction, right? So in order for you to grow your company, like I said at the start, you need to be able to acquire clients. And when I say clients, you need there's going to be a specific like need or problem or want or desire or you know drive that that client will have to purchase from you. And when you take one client, typically they share those drives and wants and needs with the rest of the market if, if the rest of the market has affinity to them. So if I take one gym owner and then I take 100 gym owners, if I, if I pick one gym owner out of 100, it's extremely likely that that one gym owner will be facing the same problems, wants, needs and desires as all the other gym owners in the market, right? And so if I select my niche as gym owners, then I can start growing my business in that direction, down that vertical. It's really hard to grow um, a business when you're, you know, your message and your offer is horizontal. It's really hard to appeal to everyone. And it's also really hard to service everyone because, you know, I can tell you now it's hard enough to solve, you know, one small problem within a market, let alone, you know, five different problems in 10 different markets. The operational drag associated with that, and the complexity is just ridiculous, right? So operational drag multiplies. So what a niche really does is it brings order to your business. So a business, it can be very chaotic without a niche because what a niche does is it it forces you to just focus in and put the blinders on and just build one thing for one person and solve one problem, right? A lot of people think that having a niche limits them and prevents the, you know, quote unquote market cap or reach of the business. But the reality is that once again, you can have anything, you just can't have everything, right? If you went into an ecosystem as an organism and said, right, I'm gonna inhabit this niche, this niche, this niche, this niche, and this niche, the chances of you being able to perform the functional role well enough to sustain like all of those niches is next to nothing. And as soon as you split your attention away from one niche into like three or four, you're spreading yourself so thin across all of those things and you're decentralizing your attention, which massively inhibits your ability to, to do well in any of them. So I'd rather do, you know, I'd rather perform it 100% in one niche than, you know, 20% in five niches. Because I can tell you now, if you only operate at 20% in any given niche, your business will fail, right? Because you'll get beaten by people that can do 30, 40, 50%, okay? Um, and it gives you um, an operational drag multiplier of one. So this is a really cool little um, word or framework that I've um, came up with to explain this. But a niche brings order. And basically, a niche is basically like your operational complexity within your company, whether you have huge amounts of clients or not, doesn't matter, Like. Right? The, the operational complexity in your business is fundamentally underpinned by your niche or by having a niche. Because if you have one niche, then you have an operational drag multiplier of one. Okay, so operational drag multipliers. So this is the term that I've coined to explain the degree to which certain variables of your business create operational complexity. Okay, and I'm going to give you some examples in a second and this will become very clear. But operational complexity inhibits profitability, scale, and focus, okay? So the more complicated your business is, the more moving parts, the more systems you have, the more variables that you have and the things that are flying around, the harder it is for your business to grow and scale. I like to have an extremely lean, straightforward business with very few variables, very few deliverables, very few complexities, very few systems, very few channels, very few team members. And I find that the, the more I get rid of, the, the more I grow. So you really can achieve more with less, right? And so the, there's two primary operational drag multipliers in your business, and they are niche and product, okay? So the, the two real big, like, the two big co core components that sit at the bottom of your entire niche, you know, all of the systems in your business sort of develop from these two things. The first one is the niche, and the second one is the product, okay? And by having one niche, then you have an operational multiplier or complexity multiplier of one, right? If you suddenly have five niches, then you have to have five different systems for everything and five different types of variable for all of the parts of your business. And it's the same thing with having like one product, right? People think that like they need lots of products to grow and scale. It's like, it's not true. If you just have one product, 
then you only have to build one thing and handle one type of client and do one type of support and have one contract. And I'll explain that and how this is so important in a second and really put it into perspective. And honestly, the key to getting to 100 grand a month, like the, the most, like the most important foundation that you can have if you take away from this program is just to have one niche and one product, right? It's entirely possible to get to 100 grand a month with 75% margins if you have one niche and one product. If anything, I'd, I'd say that like operating on a margin that's this high, like you can get to 100 grand a month with multiple niches and multiple products. I wouldn't recommend it because it will be harder, but to, to maintain really tight margins and to be really lean and have a simple business that doesn't, you know, create massive chaos and stress in your life. If you just have one niche and one product, you're going to be flying, right? And I've built a multi seven figure coaching business and a multi and, and a seven figure marketing agency. And the, the entire foundation of both those businesses has just been underpinned by one niche, one product, right? Now, if you want to get to a million dollars a month, which is something I'm working on, then you might need to have more than one product. Um, because there's a certain point where you have to have like a value ladder. But if you just want to get to like seven figures, multi seven figures, like low multi seven figures, then just having one product is good enough. And I know that we can scale Imperium to, you know, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollars a month, literally just with one product and one niche, right? So let's have a look at Imperium acquisition to understand. So what I'm going to do now is sort of quantify the operational complexity that is achievable through having a niche and being a specialist and only having one product, right? So if we take our niche, for example, so we serve high ticket service and coaching businesses. So we've only got one niche, right? We don't serve low ticket people. We don't serve like other random businesses. It's just serviced and coaching based businesses. You could almost argue this is two niches, but their models are so similar that you can count it as one. They face the same problems essentially with a few caveats. Now the product we have is easy grow, right? So as of me recording this, we only sell one thing. Now there's a chance we might be introducing another product or something else down the line. Once we feel like we've capped easy grow out with, with all of its operational capacity. Um, but right now we have one thing, okay? And what this means, right, is we get to have one of everything. <laughs> so for, for a company to run, right, for a business to, to actually um, operate and function properly, you need to have systems or variables inside of a company, right? You need to have certain, you know, things that are happening. And there's hundreds of them, but I've listed out a few here. So by having one niche and one product, we have one offer. We have one call to action, one funnel, one website, one Calendly event, one contract to get clients to sign, one product access gateway, one onboarding, ooh, one onboarding process, one community for clients, one outreach system, one evergreen video for outreach, one email account for support and you know managing people, one email list, one Facebook group, one set of standard operating procedures, one communication channel, one support ticket, channel, thumbnails, titles, videos, descriptions, one type of all of those things. We don't have to create multiple videos one cold email script, one cold email reply template, one follow-up process, one CRM sales tracker, you know, one line of questioning for our sales process, one sales script, one sales pitch. We only have one type of pricing strategy. We have one payment plan available, right? We have one sales rep onboarding process. We have one sales rep product training process. So like when you've got just like a really simple business, when you've only got one variable, you know, on both of these points, you only have to have one of everything, right? And I'm going to show you what happens in a second here when you start having more than one. It gets really complicated. So what we can do here, there's like 34 variables. Now, you know, if we do one times one times one times one times one, 34 times, we only get one because, you know, zero multiplied by zero is zero. And like a number fundamentally limits like the amount that like a multiplication equation can become. So our operational drag multiplier for Imperium is one. And this is about as simple as it gets. Our business is... I mean, I'm sure it could be more simple because there's things that we can remove from the company, but on a core like foundations level, these core variables, the niche and the product, we've engineered this thing for raw simplicity, right? Now, there's obviously going to be hundreds of more, you know, single creation variables for our company to run successfully, but our operational drag multiplier will always be one or very low. And this is because simple scales and complex fails. So if you look at your company, right, and you have to sort of like, imagine if you had to mind map out everything you needed for your company to run, right? Kind of like what I've done here, although there's a lot more to the company than this. But if you mind map out everything you've got to do, what you'll find is everything you have to do is multiplied by either your niche or your product. So if you have three products, you suddenly have to have three sales pitches. You suddenly have to have three payment plans. You suddenly have to have three types of contract. You suddenly have to have three types of clients to deal with. Then you have to have three different email lists. Then you've got to hire three different types of people. Like, 
it, it becomes like even just by adding one or two products or just splitting your niche slightly, it becomes out, it just gets out of hand as you stack these things on top of each other in terms of the operations of your business. It just gets way out of hand and it's just not necessary. And the irony is, is that when you only have one product, you can build a product that's fucking insane and that like completely dominates the market and just wipes out everything because you can put all of your energy and focus into it. You know, you've got like a couple of billion neurons in your mind. If you put those billions of neurons into just one product for like six months, you can build something that cannot be contested, right? And I firmly believe that's what we've done with EasyGrow. And that is more conducive to success and growth than having like a couple of subpar products in my opinion. And the same with the niche, right? It's like, and by only having one niche, you get to channel all of your attention into understanding that niche. As soon as you have two niches, right, you've got to juggle two different offers and two different messages and it just gets out of hand, right? So if we take another look, right? So, you know, let's have another look at a business that has two niches and one product, right? So let's say that you're still selling one product, but you think, well, you know what? I don't really believe Charlie. I'm just going to have two niches so that my reach is bigger, right? That's usually what people say. It's pretty stupid, right? So... If you've got two niches but one product, basically you have to times all of these by two, right? Because if you want to successfully serve two niches, you need to basically have two fucking businesses, right? That's literally how it works. You have one business, but inside of that one business that acts as a shell, you've actually got almost like two companies that have to operate. And then like as soon as you start selling another product or another niche, it's like you're starting an entire new business and that saps all of your attention and splits your attention. You know, they say that the man who catches or the man who chases two rabbits catches neither, right? And that's what the point is. So if we take all 34 of these variables and we say we've got two of each, then what we have to do is we have to do two times, two times, two times, two, and then we have to do that 34 times. And if we do that, what we find is the operational drag multiplier becomes 8,589,934,592, right? That is a lot of mathematical, you know, that's a massive jump. That's a lot of complexity just for adding one extra niche. And this is like, this is obviously a simplified model of reality. Like having one extra niche isn't going to make your business 8 billion times more complicated than just having one, but it does drill the point home pretty damn well, right? So I'm not saying that just adding an extra niche is literally going to make your business 8.5 billion times harder to run, but I think the exaggeration actually serves quite a strong purpose because you can sort of see, I mean, this is how the math works out. If you just times all of these things together, then you've got, it's way more complex. Um, and I don't know why anyone would want to run a business that's this more complicated when running it this way is actually more profitable, easier and more straightforward and simple and less chaotic, right? So, you know, if you ask yourself, like, who's more likely to scale? A company with an operational drag of one, right, with ridiculous margins and a smaller team, but a better product with a deeper understanding of their niche, or a company with an operational drag multiplier of you know eight billion five hundred eighty nine million nine hundred thirty four thousand five hundred ninety two right it it becomes pretty apparent as you run the math and you start looking at your business from a you know decentralized variable perspective what happens when you start introducing more than one of these core variables into your company it just creates complexity and if you feel like right now that your business is like just a fucking vehicle for chaos and it's just stress and you can't see the woods from the trees and you can't focus and you can't build any things you're putting all these fires out and there's just like like a common thing that manifests when you've got a business that's really straightforward like this is there's you solve like there's only a certain amount of problems that can arise before you start solving the same problems again so i know that within this niche and selling the type of product we sell that there are you know there's there's a maybe there's like 50 problems that clients might have that we know how to solve and those 50 problems just continuously keep coming back up over and over and over again and because we've already solved them all before because we've only got one niche and product because we've been doing this for long enough now the business is so easy to operate because all the problems that we could possibly face in our operations we've already overcome right but if we went along and just signed like a fucking like if we signed 10 recruiting businesses for our product for example right? That would introduce like a whole nother myriad of problems associated with that niche that we haven't previously faced. And then we have to allocate resources, energy, and time to solving them when the reality is that there's plenty of these businesses to work with. We do not need to split our attention, okay? And, and it's the same thing with having another product. So if, you, if, you, if you're like right now thinking, oh my God, my business is just chaos. I can't scale it. I've been plateaued for too long. I can't, I can't work on anything because there's just so much to do. I'm just so involved in the company. It's like, the first thing to do is look at your business and just start cutting some stuff away. And I'm not saying you should fire clients. What I'm saying you should do is 
restructure your business so that you only ever take on new business in accordance with one product and one niche. So if you've got like a you know 20 grand a month company right now, you're serving all sorts of different people, you've got like a bunch of different products, it's really complex. The irony is, is you probably have way more stress in your company at 20 grand a month than I do at 200 grand a month. And it's not, you know, more money doesn't mean more stress when you build your business in the right way. And so if you're in that position right now, don't think about cutting your clients, don't get rid of them because, you know, you probably don't want to do that. Instead, if someone comes to you and says, hey, can I buy this? You say, nope, sorry, we only sell this to this person from now on. And, And that's a really sort of difficult sacrifice to justify um, especially if you're not used to getting a huge amount of clients coming on board but you have to think like what's best for the company in the next five to ten years not what's best for the company in the next like two months okay and there's another little um thought experiment you can run here right so let's 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 make it even more chaotic right so this time let's look at a business that has two niches and three products right then what we have to start doing is having like multiples of fucking like six and twelve because if you've got like two niches and three products, you're gonna need six Calendly events, right? One Calendly event for each product so that you can you know, split your sales team up. And then you've got two niches, so you need to have all of this crap. Then you need six contracts and six onboarding processes. Then you need six outreach systems because you're selling six different things. Then you need to have six different types of support ticket. You need 12 payment plans if you're splitting up payments. It just, like you've got six sales pitches, you've got like two different sales rep onboarding processes. You're gonna have like, six SOPs, you've got to have two YouTube channels to manage because now you're trying to get YouTube going for two different things. It's like, it's just, it just builds chaos. And if you if you do this, if you multiply all these variables together, then you basically get a lot. Um, the, the operational drag multiplier of, of um, two niches and three products is is whatever the hell this number is. <laughs> I actually can't, um, I can't really pronounce it. I don't know exactly how you'd quantify that. But you see my point, it's like, that's a lot of complexity, right? And if you remove these things, you reduce the complexity, you increase the scalability, the profitability. And once again, this is a model, right? It simplifies reality and obviously loses a lot of objectivity in the process, but it makes the point really clear. I I don't want you thinking that, you know, Charlie's like, oh, Charlie said that if I have another niche, then my business is 8 billion times more complicated than his. Like it's, it's obviously a model, right? It's not exact, but the point stands and the metaphor is applicable. So, You know, I promise you, um, as someone who's done it twice, right, in a high ticket coaching and done for you setting, you only need one product and one niche. If you want to get to seven or multi seven figures and achieve a business exit, you only need one product and one niche. If anything, you need one product and one niche. It's actually easier to do it with one product and one niche. Okay, there's no point in doing this program and building a client acquisition system if you don't have the operational capacity to take full advantage of it, right? The easiest way to improve operational capacity is to remove products and niches until you offer one thing to one type of person, okay? And that really is like the, the, the easiest way to move the needle in terms of your operational complexity is just to either remove niches or remove products until you've just got one of each. So, you know, instead of me sitting here and giving you like a, you know, 10 hour lecture on operations and all that stuff, it's like, the first thing to do is just remove a bunch of crap, right? So for example, um, in the last three months, Imperium Agency has taken on about 90 clients. It's actually a little bit more than this. I think it's like 100, 110 or so. But we've taken on around 100 clients um, in the last three months. And this has all happened without me. All I've done is lock myself in this room to make this program, right? We haven't even flinched operationally and our profit margin hasn't suffered in the slightest. If we were a done for you business, it would be a little bit harder but it would still be manageable if all those clients were in the same niche with the same problem, right? I couldn't take on like a hundred clients in three months if I was selling like three different products and had like three different niches. It just You just can't, you've just got too much to build and too much complexity, right? And at our peak, Northflow Consulting, which is our old um, gym agency, done for you marketing agency for gyms, I think we had about 60 to 70 done for you clients and we were doing a seven figure run rate. And it wasn't, it was pretty, horrible to run because we had 60 clients right all wanting like shit from us all the time but you know we ran the same ads the same funnels and the same processes for every single client and when we got a new client we could onboard and deliver for them in two days by copy and pasting the current system so we built an onboarding process that could literally be done in two days like even then we could do it in like a whole day if we wanted to and like this really helped our clients because like a lot of marketing agencies at the time they take like 10 days to onboard someone We'd be like, yep, sign the contract and we'll get it done tomorrow. 
<laughs> and then like the ads would be up and running and people like from from giving us money and signing a contract to getting appointments and people through their door there was only like a 36 to 48 hour window and not only that but because we had like 60 to 70 clients we had constant feedback and data and we were able to test so many different variables and when we found like if one thing worked for one client we test it for another and if it worked better for that client as well then we'd update all of our clients campaigns with that one thing and so when you've got if you're running a done for you business or a coaching business it helps just to do one niche because like right now i've got this hive mind in imperium before we're building this product the, the old product of about 380 agency owners and coaches right and all of them are using like different copies and stuff and if i find one of them using one piece of copy and it works well and somebody else says it works then i can go and build that out for everybody right so it, it creates a massive advantage and for a done for you service a single niche and product allows you to have one of everything right so not only does it make your client acquisition more straightforward but it makes your service delivery more straightforward right it, it just like it's like people who do custom web design builds every time they sign a client or someone that builds custom funnels or does custom copywriting or custom ads like tailored tailored work unless extremely high ticket is extremely inefficient like it just doesn't make any sense to me right so that's that and then for a coaching service you kind of get the same luxury it's like we have one program we have one field of expertise we have one type of problem like i know that if you come to us with an issue that like oh no charlie i'm i've done this now i've got this problem like the chances of us having already successfully solved that problem for somebody else in your exact situation is like 95 percent. and because of that like your experience with us is like massively improved because of how quickly we move right and we also have one coaching style and we have way more with less, right? So always look to remove things from your business, not add them, less is more, right? So from now on, I want you to sort of you know, make a little promise to yourself on your pen and paper right now, and just say, I promise to look to remove things, not add things to my business. You want one product and one niche. And then one day you might be like, oh, like, yeah, I could do this like little Google review campaign thing for clients and then charge them like an extra $200 a month. Like, nope. Think of the, think of the fucking complexity that comes with that. It's not just, the, the cost isn't, you know, the, the cost to the client isn't the $200 a month. The cost to the client is you having removed your focus from the main problem that you're solving for them. And that will cost you way more money than the extra $200 a month you could make. So ask yourself, if I suddenly solved all of your acquisition issues. So if I, if I, this is a thought experiment to drill the point home, right? If I gave you like 20 high ticket clients this month, right? In different niches for a bunch of different products, could you service them all within a week and keep them happy and retain them? The, the answer is probably no. So if the answer is no, then how is this program gonna help you, right? So my point here is like, I'm gonna teach you how to build client acquisition systems that will completely blow your mind, right? Especially as you go through this foundations module, you'll, it will start to dawn on you how easy this stuff's gonna become for you. But like, we intend on helping you build systems that can help you sign like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, hundreds of clients, right? Every month or every month, every year, whatever it looks like. And th what's the point in us helping you do that if if your business can't take it on? It's like, there isn't a point, right? So we just need to like re reduce your operational drag. And the easiest way to do that is, is by starting with the niche and the product. It's where you can get the most asymmetric leverage to sort of remove the complexity in your company. And so it becomes quite clear, like if you run this thought experiment, like, okay, well, if I, if you did just give me like my acquisition solution, would I actually be able to handle the clients? It's like a lot of people want to fix their client acquisition problem, but it's kind of like even if you fix your client acquisition problem if you've still got this complicated chaotic business it doesn't actually solve any issue at all because the goal of the company is obviously to retain cash right and make money and facilitate your lifestyle or whatever you want to buy or whatever you're looking for in a company right but it, it, you can have as many appointments and sales calls as you want but there will come a natural point where you're fundamentally bottlenecked to your operations so most most people they think they've got an acquisition issue but the reality is that like they kind of have but when they solve that it becomes apparent that the real issue they've got is operational okay and so like i said the fastest way to a smooth lean operation is removal okay so let's talk about specialist advantage so a couple of final questions to ask if you're on the fence about having a niche right just summarizes it who makes more money a general doctor or a heart surgeon right well the heart surgeon makes more money because like if you've got, if you need to have heart surgery, like, would you rather pay a heart surgeon who's 
going to be better, more, or a general doctor less, right? You'd probably pick the heart surgeon. And which athletes achieve greatness, right? Generalist athletes or athletes who focus on one sport or even one role in the sport, right? So like, you know, imagine if you take like American football, like the NFL, for example, you've got like, you know, imagine someone who was like, yeah, I'm going to be a quarterback, but I'm also going to be a running back. <laughs> it, it just wouldn't work. Or like, imagine someone like, who was like an Olympic sprinter. Like, imagine if Usain Bolt was like, yep, yeah, I'm going to be the best at 100 meters, but I'm also going to be the best at 8,000 meters. It's like, you can't, it just doesn't work, right? He, you no, you wouldn't know who Usain Bolt was if that was his idea. And is it better to solve your market's main, most painful problem 100% of the way, or to solve 10 of their smaller problems 10% of the way? Well, like I can tell you by doing this, you'll make more money and alleviate more pain, which adds more value, which means you're going to be more profitable. And, you know, are you going to make more money by being the best in one market or being subpar average in all of them? right? It's like, it doesn't take much critical thinking. It doesn't take a genius to come to the conclusion that having a niche actually is the best idea. And like, I've had people before who like, you know, I've, I've got some friends who have like generalist businesses and they've been capped at like, you know, certain levels of income in the company for a long time. And I'm always like, why don't you just have another niche? And then they always say like, oh, well, if I had another niche, like, I think I just find a business quite boring because like, I like to have lots of different problems to solve and different types of customers. And I'm like, fair enough but like what you'd find is that you'd find way more and this is my perspective right it might, it might not be for everyone but i think that those people would find more satisfaction and meaning solving one problem extremely deep for one type of person and learning all the intricacies and nuances of that and becoming a true expert than they would just sort of like putting out fires but you know each their own so key points generalists face chaos okay this is just a fact so if you're a generalist, you're going to face chaos. And if you're a specialist, you will face and create order. Chaos inhibits growth. Order facilitates growth. So simplicity is conducive to scale. Deep somewhere beats shallow everywhere. 100 kilometers in one direction gets you further than 10 kilometers in 10 directions. And 10,000 hours in one area creates more authority than 1,000 hours in 10 areas, right? Like, once again, if you were having, like, a heart surgery and someone said to you, right, okay, well, I've got two options for you. You can go with the heart surgeon who's put 10,000 hours and has conducted, like, 3,000 surgeries specifically on hearts. Or you can go with the general surgeon who's probably done about 200 heart surgeries and has spent about 1,000 hours on, you know, heart surgery research. Who would you rather go with? It's like, who's got more authority? You're not going to be like, oh, well... The person who's only done 200 surgeries, like, oh, like, oh yeah, but he's also done brain surgery and like kidney surgery. Like you wouldn't care, you know? It's like you care about solving one problem and you're gonna pick the best man for the job. And you'll probably pay the heart surgeon way more than the specialist, okay? So there is a caveat to this. So, you know, after becoming the best in one area, you can branch out into others, right? This, but you can't really do that until you truly become like the very best, right? Like. Kanye West, for example, he got, he basically became like, I mean, it's subjective, but a lot of people believe he became the best musician, right? And then he thought, well, fuck that, I'm going to go into fashion, right? Or Arnold Schwarzenegger um, obviously became the greatest bodybuilder on the planet. And after that, you know, he went into politics and ended up becoming the governor of California and going into business and stuff. And Amazon, right? Amazon actually started selling just books. So Amazon niched down to just selling books at the beginning. And that's also, by the way, where the Kindle came from. But obviously now Amazon sells literally everything. But even Amazon, right, started with a niche. So I don't think anyone can really argue with this. It's, it's kind of hard to argue with, right? So now that you understand why we need a niche, let's talk about picking one. And before you pick one, um, before I tell you what to pick or how to pick one, I want to make sure we're covering um, some ground here with the potential mistakes that you might make whilst picking one, because I think that, you know, it's more important, you know, not what, what not to do than what to do sometimes, because otherwise you're going to make a mistake, right? And often like success is just not making mistakes. So before we select a profitable niche, let's discuss the three main mistakes people make when picking one. So there's three primary mistakes. And the first one is worrying about competition, okay? So you should not concern yourself with the size and competence of your competition. The market is big enough for you if you're talented and can solve a problem for it. 
So I like to look at markets like I'm not necessarily looking at the competitors in the market because I know that it, all I have to do is be as better than them. And most people aren't very good at what they do. So I'm never worried about competition because I know that I can outcompete after a few months of hard work. Now you also have to realize that there's only a small percentage of your competitors that are actually able to compete with you, right? So let's say for example, that there's 2000 people competing with you for the same clients. However, only 10% of them are probably gonna have more than four to five clients and only 2.5% of them can actually solve the problems the market is facing. So I'm never worried about competition because I know that none of them are really gonna be true competitors to me. So when I look at like my market, for example, and this whole, you know, high ticket online appointment booking sales environment, like I don't know how many people I'm competing with. I've never really looked to be honest, but I'd imagine there's like a few thousand people. And the, 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 fun, the funny thing is, is like, I know that 99% of them, like they won't actually be able to solve someone's problem. So I'm sure you're aware of that because <laughs> it probably ain't the first rodeo you've had or the first program you've purchased to try and solve this damn problem that you're facing. And I promise we'll solve it for you. I promise we will. And you'll be very happy with it. But like, it's, it's extremely rare for a business to actually be able to solve the problem. And so it's very common for your market to invest in solutions that don't actually work and then continuously reinvest until they do find something that works. And even then, after they found something that works, they'll probably try and reinvest in something else again, because that's just what business owners do. So like I know, for example, when we were in the gym space and when we were working with gym owners that like, I was always like, I was never really, well, I was worried about it at the beginning, but like I sort of came around to the fact of thinking like, well, okay, there's all of these gyms and all these agencies. Most agencies suck and can never keep clients for more than two months. So even if like every agency is signing like 10 clients a month, there's still gonna be like, you know, 10 clients every other month coming out of the market ready to buy something else. And I used to be terrified in the gym niche because of competition until I asked myself this. There are 60,000 gyms in my niche. All I need is 30 clients to get to 50 grand a month. That's 0.05% of the market, provided I'm good at solving a problem for it. Do you think it's possible to claim 0.05% of the market, right? And I can tell you now that that is absolutely true. You know, it's like, I mean, with Imperium, for example, right, we're making like multi seven figures now, and we've probably only claimed like less than 1% of the market still. <laughs> you know, markets are fucking huge. And I think like and for you to be worried about like competition is ridiculous. Because like, let's say that you wanted to build a company to 300 grand a month. And let's say that each customer was worth 10 grand to you, right? Well, you'd only need to sign 30 people a month for you to, to do that, which is like 360 people a year. And then if you think about it, the market might be like, I don't know, let's say the market's like 100,000 100, strong, like, like you're still signing less than 3% of the market a year or whatever that works out to be. Probably even less than that, like 0.3% of the market is how many people you have to sign per year. So don't worry about competition. The market is big enough. The, the main thing to know is that like, if you become good at what you do and if you actually add value and you try to become the best of the best, you will not have to worry about competition. If anything, like, this might sound a little bit um, obnoxious, right? But I believe this to be true. I don't really believe that anyone can compete with Imperium. And that's because of how good I know our product is. And that's because I like of how much work has gone into it and investment and time and, and energy. I know that nobody has got the ability to do what I've done with this module, for example. Like I just I just know nobody can do that because it, it was fucking awful. So that's the thing about competition. I, I really wouldn't worry about it, okay? Now, the other thing is saturation and worrying about saturation, right? You should not concern yourself with saturation because a niche never saturates, right? Niches do not saturate, offers and client acquisition methods do. For as long as there are people with problems, there are opportunities for you to get clients by solving them, right? So uh, something, a niche could only become saturated if every single business owner in that niche suddenly had their problem solved. And that doesn't happen. <laughs> right? Because there's no business, there's no competition that you have that could support the entire market solution. It just is, it's not possible. So there's, there's no chance that a niche can ever saturate. Saturation is only an issue when your business looks like all of your competitors, or when you use the same methods as everybody else to try and get and acquire clients, right? Positioning is power and it solves the problem of saturation. So 
I see this a lot. Like if someone tells me they think a market is saturated, it's a really clear and painful sign that they haven't actually tried to do anything different. It's like, what do you expect? If you come into a market and you just suddenly start doing the same thing as everybody else, you sing the same song, you offer the same thing, you present your business in the same way, you position your service in the same way, you do the same cold methods, you do the same thing. Like people think that like they, they, they delude themselves into thinking markets are saturated, but the truth and the reality and the objective nature of it is that like they just haven't, they're just the same as everybody else, right? And so, you know, the appearance of a business is what saturates. The position of a company or its product or service, that's the thing that gets saturated. It's like, um, you know, let's say for example, you started a supplement business, right? Like, you know, a lot of people say that the supplement niche is really saturated for, for e-commerce or whatever. But it's like, it's only saturated because everybody starts a business and tries to sell the same supplements to the same people in the same way for the same price. It's, it's just like, it's, it just, it makes me laugh. So I used to be terrified of the gym niche being saturated because everyone and their nan seemed to run a gym marketing agency until I realized that 99% of people are doing the same thing, snowballing their situation. So I'm here to tell you that saturation or quote unquote appearance perceived saturation is actually a really good thing, right? Because if, if everyone starts doing the same thing, then that thing becomes extremely weak right? And nobody's going to stop doing it because they're monkey see monkey doers, right? So all you have to do is seem a little bit different. Like the more people that do the same thing, the smaller difference you need to have from them in order for your offer and positioning to be way better, right? So, you know, if, if I didn't do what everybody else did, I'd seem even more different and able to get clients. If an offer or method saturates, it's actually a good thing because it makes new offers and methods that you can develop in this program 10 times better. So, let's say you look at your competition and they all have the same offer and the same positioning and the same price and the same type of business, right? The, the more people that join them, the worse they become as a group, right? The worse they become as a group, the easier it is for you to gain an advantage just by being slightly different from them. So you almost want markets to saturate because then you can, like I know in, in this market, for example, with the high ticket appointment booking sales thing, like the more people that join and just continue like doing the same thing as everybody else, the better Imperium becomes because, <laughs> because our message is just different. And like, we, we just have positioned ourselves in a completely different way because we are better, right? So that's, that's the saturation thing. You should want it. You shouldn't worry about it, right? And copycatting, right? Most people pick their niche based on monkey see, monkey do logic. This means they look at a niche everybody else is in and pick that. They look to the gurus and the 997 core sellers, finding out what niche they are in and then picking that. This is wrong. You should select a niche based on whether or not you're interested in it and whether or not it makes sense at the time. So the best way I can put this is to tell you that a niche is like a stock, right? So, it, you know, if everyone and then some random dude in a Discord server tells you to buy a stock, it's usually time to sell it, right? There's this saying on Wall Street, like if your taxi driver tells you what to buy, you should go and short that thing, right? Or something like that. And the same thing is true with niches, right? So if you just suddenly see everybody and their mum and their dad and their uncle and their fucking dog getting into one niche or moving to the same offer or moving to one like method, like as soon as you see this mass migration of, you know, fucking monkeys or, you know, whatever you want to call it, people going to one thing, you should move as far away from that as you can, okay? Because if you get swept up and dragged into the hype, then it will work for a short period of time. And then basically it all comes crashing down. It's no different from a stock like Bitcoin, right? When Bitcoin rallied and like everybody started saying it was the best thing in the world. And then it went way beyond the point that was actually rational. That, like the, the point Bitcoin was at did not represent the true value of Bitcoin. And then the market corrected itself and a lot of people lost a lot of money. So it's the same thing with niches. So here's an example, right? A client of mine, Luca, um, he scaled from zero to 70 grand a month in like, I think three or four or six months or so. Um, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. But Luca, um, he scaled from like zero to 70 grand a month, nearly eight figures, um, seven figures, sorry, in this short period of time in the land clearing niche, which I didn't even know was a thing. <laughs> so like nobody and nobody in their right mind has ever looked to go into the land clearing niche, right? And he was doing marketing. Nobody does that. And so like he went into it and, you know, obviously the problem with being like, you know, the first into a niche, it's a little tricky because you've got to figure it all out yourself. But, you know, he did and no land clearer has ever received a cold call from someone giving them a good offer. They've received cold calls, but not good ones, right? And so like that was one example. And like 
there's all sorts of other niches that I hear people going into. Like another one was yacht chartering, right? Or um, solar panel, um, like domestic solar panel cleaning. Like there's all of these like weird little, you know, niches like yoga treat, yoga retreats was another one and um, tree surgery, right? There's all of these niches that people just, like, because it's not like, the, the because people don't see them as like the masses, not everybody's doing it, people kind of avoid them, right? So, you know, it, it helps to sort of go out of your, you know, out of your um, current peripheral view of what everybody else is doing. Another example, right? So a while ago, when, well, this is a long time ago, this is before I even started my first agency, I actually tried to start an e-commerce marketing agency because every guru had an e-com agency. But what I realized pretty quickly was that all of the gurus started their e-com agency like three to three to five years ago when e-com was an easier niche and wasn't as punishing. So, you know, as of me recording this in, you know, November of 22, the e-com niche for, for, for marketing agencies is, is it's awful, right? It's, it's, I would never touch it with a barge pole, right? But for some reason, like, because you've got all of these, you know, social media gurus, marketing agency gurus in the e-com niche, Everyone just assumes that like the e-com niche is the right thing to do because that's what the people that they look up to do. But you've got to realize that the people you look up to, A, they spend a shit ton of money on ads to acquire clients, and B, they started like five years ago when it was easy. And now they've built a massive foothold and advantage. And yeah, it just, I just, people just don't see it. So just be careful of that. So let's have a look at the best niche here, right? Because there's a framework and a way of thinking, right? It's a simple question. What is the best niche? Well, the best niche is the one that you stick to for one to two years, right? What is the best niche? The one that you stick to. That's literally like, I can't give you better advice than that when it comes to niche selection. The The longer and more time you spend in a niche trying to improve your service and understand the niche further, the easier it becomes for you to build a business and acquire clients, right? It takes time to understand the intricacies and nuances of a niche and all niche related problems can be solved with time. So a lot of people like they niche hop, like they get into one niche and then like three months later they change because it's too painful and then two months later they get into something else and then there's another niche like six weeks later and then they do a different service within that niche. It's like people just don't, they can't stick to it because it just seems to, for whatever reason, become too painful for them. But I'm telling you now that like for as long as you like are only like three to six months into a niche, business is always going to feel hard. <laughs> That's just like the truth of it. Like when you're starting, like when you start a new niche, you're faced with a huge myriad of different problems and that's how it works. It's like when you switch niche, you start a different business basically. When you switch product, you start a different business basically. These core things that underpin your business, you need to give, the product needs to have time and energy put into it to make it good and the niche needs to have time and energy put into it to understand it so the product can be built around it, right? And if you're not willing to sit and, you know, sit with the pain of a new niche for a couple of years, then you're not going to build a successful company, right? And now, you know, you might ask yourself, well, what is the worst niche? Well, the worst niche is the one you just hopped into, right? So the worst niche is the one that you just started. And that might sound like a bit contradictory, but the point is that like it, the worst niche is the niche that you're in for the first like, you know, couple of months. And the best niche is the niche you've been in, which is the existing one you're in, which is the worst one, but just for a couple of years. So when you pick a niche, it immediately becomes the worst niche you could have picked because you know, it's like, it's gonna suck for a couple of months because you don't understand it. But the longer you stick with that pain, the better it becomes, right? And so niches, they mature, they're like fucking wine, right? The longer you keep them and the longer you keep them around and you know tend to them, the, the better they become. Niches kind of age like wine, whatever you wanna look at it like that. So all of the problems in your business are created by your lack of knowledge or experience, not your niche. So this is really common where someone hops into a niche and then they, they, they either run into a problem with acquisition or client retention, right? They're like, oh, like I just can't solve this or I can't solve this. It's, it's just the problem with the niche. It's like, if you had the knowledge and the experience to solve that problem, you would have solved it. So you should never ever offset or pawn off the responsibility for a problem onto your niche. Like the problem might be manifesting because you are in that niche, but you are the reason that it exists and hasn't been solved, not the niche. The harder a niche is in the beginning, the less people will stick to it, the easier it is to become the best. So this is why there's a degree to which I kind of like hard niches, right? Because like the, the, the harder a niche is to get off the ground, like the harder it is to start, the less people are gonna stick to it and the easier it is to become the best. Because if you think about it, like 
if, if, if you imagine for a second, like to start a company, so if you pick a niche, let's let's take the um the appointment booking niche for these for agencies and coaches and consultants like I'm in at the moment. It's like it's it's quite a good niche actually, the one that I'm in. I quite like it. But to begin, it was quite hard because you've got to sell people, you've got to overcome all this market saturation. And like I've put up with like two and a half years or two years of just pain to build a company to the point it's at now. And I know that for someone to compete with me on the level at which I'm at, they've got to put up with that same amount of pain. And I know that most people don't have the stomach for that. And so the more you can wade through in your niche and the further you can go to it and through it, the more fire you can sit in over like a year or two, the less people are going to be able to actually do that, which means the less competition you have, the easier it is to really dominate. And, you know, the caveat to this is like, you need to know when it's time to give up. So I do not advocate niche hopping unless it makes sense, right? So if you've relentlessly tried to make a niche work for one to two years, and by making it work, I mean doing the work literally every day, like doing outreach every day, trying to solve problems every day, showing up and doing cold calls and cold emails and inbound and ads every day. Like if you've really like tried this niche for like one to two years and it still isn't working and it's still giving unsolvable pushback, then you can switch. But, you know, what I can tell you is no matter which niche you look at, at least the main major ones, all of the main major niches you look at have got people making seven or multi seven figures in. What that means is that it's actually possible to solve the problem you're facing right now. Because if someone else can do it, then it means you can as well. And it just means you have to arrive at the same solutions they arrived at, right? So like, for example, if you're in a niche and like, let's say you're doing like, um, let's say you coach people on like, I don't know how to become, like how to lose weight or something. It's like, you might right now be struggling with that niche because you might be finding it hard to hold your clients accountable or get your clients to actually do what you tell them to do. And that's a problem that stops you from scaling because it inhibits results. But there are coaches out there, health coaches that make, you know, multi-millions of dollars every year who have who they're in the same niche and their clients don't struggle with the eating. So that means there is a way to solve the problem. A solution does exist. You just have to put up with it for long enough to solve it, okay? And that's why the best niche is the one that you stick to for a long time. Because the further you understand it, the deeper you go into it, the better it becomes. And then it also gets really easy to acquire clients as well. And rowing the boat. So this is the quote from Warren Buffett. It doesn't matter like, it doesn't matter how hard you row. It matters what boat you're in. And you can row as hard as you want. But if the boat you're designed or sat in was designed to sink from the get-go, there isn't much point. So pick wisely, right? So I'm going to give you an example here. This is a real life example, right? So one of our um, team members um, who's with us is a guy called Oscar, right? And I love him to bits. So Oscar's, um, he was actually a client of Imperium's. Um, and, you know, he was in the lawyer niche for about two years, right? And this dude, like, he's a fucking animal, right? He sent like 20,000 cold emails and he sent an ungodly amount of cold messages and did cold calls to this niche to no avail. He didn't have any money to run ads and he didn't have an, any understanding of the niche to create an inbound system. So I told him to come and work for us because... I saw in Oscar, I was like, this dude, like, he knows what's good. Like, even though he hasn't had any results from this niche for like, you know, best part of like 18 months, two years, like he's got up and done it every day. So <laughs> I was like, you know what? I kind of respect that. So I thought like, he's obviously got this sort of determination. So I told him to come and work for us um, to do appointment setting. And like, he's the best appointment setter that I've ever laid my eyes on. Like the dude, I think he booked like single-handedly like 160 appointments one month. And now we've took him on to do sales and he's like a couple of weeks into sales and he's already put himself at a multi six figure income through, 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 through selling. And so like, when we're looking at Oscar's story here, like there was Oscar and then there was the lawyer niche, right? Oscar is very talented. He's very determined. He's got a great work ethic and he's got a great mindset. And I know that he is going to be very successful. I mean, he already is being successful with Imperium. But the problem with Oscar is that he was rowing like as hard as he could for like two years, but the boat he was sat in, which was the lawyer niche, just wasn't conducive to growth, right? And we established in the end that like, you know, a lot of lawyers, they don't need the work. And a lot of the time, like they don't, they don't read emails because they've got assistants that screen them. And like, so yeah, I mean, it might be the case the lawyer niche does work. I don't want you to sort of just think that the lawyer niche just doesn't work because of Oscar's case. But I checked out like his systems and stuff and like the dude just did not stop for like two years and he tried so many variables to no avail, right? And a bad person, or sorry, a great person in a bad niche will get bad results and a bad person in a great niche will get good results, right? 
So this is the thing to understand is like the, the main, you know, the main factor that multiplies the success of your company, the, the, the core thing is the niche. Obviously alongside the product, it's the niche, right? And Oscar was rowing as hard as he could in a boat that was never built to move. So it's important to pick wisely, which is why I've now got this checklist for you. So what I've got here is something called the niche selection checklist. So if you've already got a niche, then that's probably quite likely you've got a niche. You can just move on to the niche market research resource, which is going to be later on in the video. Um, I'd still recommend, to be honest, that you actually watch this one because it might help you justify the current niche you're in or make you realize some things. So what I'm going to do is give you a checklist with a series of questions. And I'm not here to tell you which niche to pick. It has to be your idea and decision. So I'm not even going to give you like niches that I would suggest because first of all, like I haven't been in many niches, right? So I don't know. I've served a lot of people in lots of different niches, but what I can tell you is that it's not like, it doesn't matter which niche you pick. It's extremely likely you can scale it to seven or multi seven figures. There are a few exceptions. You're going to have to get very unlucky to pick one that really sucks. But for the most part, like all of them work, all of them can be done. And whilst I set up here that, you know, the main variable is the niche, like truly the, the main variable that will determine the success is you. Like you can always solve pretty much any problem. Um, but obviously it's nice to have like a, you know, an easier route to travel, if that makes sense. So what I've got here is this niche selection checklist. And so on this, um, it serves as a framework to test the strength of a niche or the viability of a niche. And you think of a niche and run it through this checklist, right? So keystone questions. So on this checklist, we've got keystone questions and we've got general questions. So keystone questions must be ticked, right? If they're not ticked, the niche is unviable. So there's a series of questions, there's like three or four of them that are absolutely imperative. If, if you can't answer yes or in the affirmative to the questions that are keystone, then you shouldn't go into the niche, right? And then we've got general questions. So for a niche to be viable, you want to tick all of the keystone questions and at least 70% of the general questions, right? It's not a hard rule. You maybe only tick 50% and you'd still do amazing. Like for example, with Luca in the land clearing niche, um, I'm pretty sure that like he would only be able to tick like 50% of the general questions, right? But the point is that like, it's not a hard rule, but this will increase the chances of you being successful by picking a niche. Okay. So there's a couple of points before we actually get into the selection. So first of all, you're not married to a niche, right? So if you really hate the niche, you can always switch. I wouldn't recommend it, but you know, there's no point in doing something that's making you miserable because otherwise you're not going to want to work. You do not pick two niches. It's not smart to pick two. This is like a really common mistake I see from people who are either going from, like if they've got a generalist business and they have to niche down, they end up picking two niches because they're so polarized and jammed to this belief that, you know, more is more. It's not a good idea, right? And also the more specific the niche, the better. And you should not spend ages deciding. You should pick well and pick fast. So the whole point of the checklist is to enable you to make a quick informed decision, okay? So you've probably got some niches in your mind, right? I'm, I'm not going to give you a list of ones that I think you should pick or ones that should give you quote unquote inspiration because they need to come from you, right? It needs to be your idea. I can't bias you in any way because in order for you to be successful, um, you need to have a niche and for you to really do well in a niche and really want to work in a niche, it needs to be your idea. If I tell you what niche to work in and you have to go to work on that every day, as soon as you start running into problems and pain, you're going to be less likely to try and put up with them and solve them because it wasn't your idea to go into the fucking niche in the first place, right? So let's have a look at this um, niche selection checklist, okay? So what you can see is we've got keystone questions and general questions. So here's the checklist. So first of all, we've got these keystone questions, these four big ones. So does the niche need what you are selling, right? So if this niche does not have a painful problem you can solve, they won't purchase from you. Pain drives client acquisition. And we'll talk about that more in the next video. So for example, a client of mine went into veterinary practices, right? She was like, I'm going to sell um, growth services to vets, but 90% of them don't need help getting customers. Like all these veterinary practices were like, I actually don't need, like, I, I need another location, not more, not more business, right? So that's the thing. You, you first of all need to make sure that the niche actually needs what you're selling. Do they have a problem that is painful enough for them to buy a solution? Now, if there's a fantastic niche with a super painful problem, you can always figure out how to solve it and basically build your skill set around that, right? Creating your product around your market is better than creating your market around your product, right? So the biggest constraint that most businesses have is their skill set or their product. It's like, this is all I can do. This is all I can offer. This is all I know I can do. So that's what I have to create 
like my business around. Like you want to build your business from the niche outwards. You don't want to build it from the product outwards. So right now, if you want to go into a certain niche because you know it's gonna be a great niche, but the product that you have doesn't really solve that niche's problem, but it kind of does, but you need to add some stuff to it, then I would add some stuff to it. Now, obviously it really helps if your existing skill set, talents and products are you know, capable of solving the problem the niche has, and you might want to build your company with that premise in mind. But if you're starting from scratch or you wanna sort of you know, build a different trajectory for your company, it makes sense to sort of you know, create the, the product around the market's needs instead of the other way around. So does this niche need what um, they are selling, right? So does this niche's niche need what they are selling? So this is a really interesting point because it's further upstream of this. So it's like, obviously your niche has a niche, right? So for example, does the market, the people in your niche operate in, need what your niche is selling? Does the market have pain that can be alleviated by the niche, right? What, what that means is if I'm working with gyms, right? Do local people to gyms need a gym membership, right? If the answer is no, then then probably not. It's like, you know, if you, let's say you, you choose to work with like, I don't know, like boutique candle shops or something, right? On the on like a high street or like a, in a mall or something. It's like the question you have to ask, like do people actually need candles? Like, because the more someone needs something, the easier it is to market a solution for them to buy it. And you know, if you're gonna be helping these businesses grow, the main thing you should be looking for is product market fit, right? So that's another good one. Is the niche growing, right? Are more businesses or people, right? Because you might not be working with, with businesses, right? Are more businesses or people entering this market and being created, or is the niche shrinking? The market must be expanding for you to have a shot at long-term success, because if a market shrinks, so does your business, right? So if you're working with like, um, let's say that you, you help newspapers, right? Sell more copies. It's like the newspaper industry like shrinks by like 20% year on year. So that's pretty exponential shrinkage. And if that means that you know, you're in that market, then that means you're gonna shrink as well, right? Can this niche afford high ticket prices? So this is the thing, like we should be selling high ticket, right? And we'll talk more about pricing in the next video. But does this niche make enough money to afford high ticket prices? Can they readily invest and value at a high price? To find out if they can, you should look no further than the prices of the biggest and most successful competitor you have, right? So if you're gonna go into like the student niche, well, it probably isn't a good idea because students aren't gonna be able to afford high ticket prices, right? So the easiest way to know like, what can I charge is just look at your competition, right? Look at the ones that are just doing the best and, and just ask yourself what they charge. Now I know that I said earlier, you should disregard competition and not copy people, but it's a good thing to know that there are people in your niche like servicing your customers at that price because it demonstrates that the market is willing to pay that price to have the same problem solved, right? And so some other general questions, are you interested in this niche, right? We wanna be ticking this one. By the way, you need to make a copy of this, go to file, make a copy. Are you interested in this niche, right? Are there more than 30,000 people in this niche, right? This is only really gonna apply if you wanna to get to more than 10 grand a month. Cause like if you wanna run ads and build an inbound system, you need to have like a relatively large market, right? Will you, um, will you have competitors already succeeding in this niche? So this is a good one because contrary to popular belief, Competition is a good thing because it indicates a sign of life, right? Imagine that like your business is like, you're like a fish, right? And you're, you're a fish and you get to pick which pond you live in, right? Or lake. You'd rather pick a pond or a lake with other successful fish because this indicates the water isn't toxic and there's plenty of food. So if you're, if you're a fish and you get to pick a pond and you go and check a pond out and there's like no fish in there, you'd be terrified because you'd be like, what the hell is in this pond, <laughs> you know? So it's good to have competition and it indicates that there's, you know, food and capability for survival. Are the offers in this niche realistic for you to keep, um, to compete with after six months of work? So some niches just like, the barrier to entry is just ridiculous because the offers are insane and illogical. So for example, to compete in the done for you e-commerce marketing niche, you need to promise a 5X ROAS or a 30% growth in revenue in 30 days. It's just irrational because not many people can deliver on this. So when you're looking at your niche, it helps to go to some of your competition and look like, what are these guys actually offering? Like, is it, it, does it seem a little bit ridiculous? And would it seem pretty apparent that the market doesn't believe a word of what these people are saying because they've been burned so much? Does this niche give your business a minimal operational drag multiplier? So what you need to ask yourself is like, are all the businesses or the people in this niche the same? Not identical, but do they share the same problem and do they have the same nature? 
can you deliver the same service variables every time to this niche? So like if you're working in the e-commerce niche, for example, every business is different because it has a different product, which means you have to build a different system every time, right? So the, the e-commerce niche is kind of like a generalist niche because if you take on an e-commerce business and then they're like, one of them sells a treadmill and the other one sells a fucking candle, you've got to, you've got to build systems for two different products. It's just, it, it's chaos, right? So you want to look for niches that have minimal operational drag multipliers, like the gym one, right? I know that if I, ta I could take on a hundred CrossFit gyms and deliver them all the same thing and they'd all be happy, maybe with one or two exceptions, right? Can people in this niche be easily found and contacted? So this is like the, the, the key to like outbound prospecting, like how easy is it to actually, you know, curate a list of these people and contact them? And if B2B, do you care about the impact of the work of the people in this niche, right? This is a really good question to ask. Like, you know, if you're serving businesses, like if you're servicing a business and you don't necessarily agree with or like the impact of their like service, then you're probably going to be unconsciously driven away from helping them, right? Like let's say for example that, I don't know, like you really hate like smoking, but then your niche is like, I help cigarette brands grow. <laughs> it's like, you know, you're probably not going to be very motivated. So you need to ask yourself if you care about the impact of the work. And this is why the gym niche works so well for me because like I knew that every time I got a lead for a gym, that was another person that I've introduced to fitness and healthier living, right? And that was a really good meaning for me. And does this niche hang out on online social media platforms, right? Because if they do, then you can use inbound marketing on social platforms and get appointments in this niche, right? So you need to, th you need to think logically about this. If you cannot find people in this niche easily, right? And if there's less than 30,000 people and this niche does not hang out on online social media platforms, then you, you can't use ads because the market's too small, right? You can't use outbound because you can't find the people and you can't use inbound because like they, they don't hang out on social media. So it's like you, you have to start thinking logically about this, like, fuck, like where am I gonna get these people from? So you need to be careful, right? Does this niche have a gatekeeper to screen all outbound contact attempts, right? So can you use cold outbound strategies to directly contact the decision makers in your niche or are you gonna get screened, right? For example, if you go into the dental niche, right? If you try and do cold email or cold calling and sometimes even cold messaging, like these dentists, they are professionals and they have receptionists to screen emails and cold calls, right? So you need to just bear that in mind and be careful. And do you understand this niche or could you get to grips with it quickly? So you need to ask yourself like, you know, does this niche make sense to you? Do you or can you easily understand the mechanics of this niche? So it's like, if you're thinking about going into like, I don't know, let's say like you wanna go into the FinTech niche, right? Financial technology. Like if you don't know the first thing about FinTech, like is it a good idea for you to go into it? Maybe, it depends how fast of a learner you are, but it's generally gonna be of your advantage if you understand the niche. Like this is why I, I, I kind of pick gyms for this reason as well, because like I had been like, um, I've been training in the gym like every day for like three years, right? And it's the same thing with the agency owner niche and the coach niche. It's like I am a coach and I was an agency owner. So I know the niche better than like anyone who is outside of the niche because I've done it, right? And I've solved all of your problems for myself. And that's why I'm so good at teaching you how to solve them for yourself, right? And do you speak the language of this niche or could you get to grips with it quickly? If you don't speak the language, you'll alienate them. So. These are the questions that I believe determine whether or not a niche is going to be good. And the key thing to realize here is that a niche isn't good or bad. It's only good or bad in relation to you and your business, right? So if you sell something and if you're adamant on selling a product that the, a niche doesn't need, then that niche is bad for you or weak for you, right? One niche for one person could be amazing. Another niche for another could be completely awful. Like the niches don't exist standing alone. You have to apply a human and their business to them to determine whether or not they're good or bad, right? And this is why I hate it when people ask me what the best niche is, right? Or when someone says like, Charlie, what are the what do you think the best niches are? I'm like, dude, I have no idea what your situation is. I have no idea about the variables of your company. And it's impossible for me to give you a straight answer because I need information to answer it. And so. But for some reason, people just don't see it like that, which is quite frustrating, but you know, such, such is the, the world of the online space, right? So now let's have a look um, through this. So what I need you to do now is pause the video, 
and just you know think of some niches that you might want to go through now the other thing you can do as well is reverse engineer this right so start off by looking at these look at the big questions the main ones and then see if you can go and make a list for yourself of niches that you're interested in right and um and reverse engineer it so i would really say i mean the interested one is i would almost say it's a keystone question but it doesn't have to be because I know a lot of people that have done it without being interested in the niche, like they're just interested in money, right? So you can go through these questions and you can start like curating your own lists of niches that you think like could be a fit based on the questions and, and you know, trying to get all of these ones ticked if that makes sense. Um, I'm not going to give you a list. Like I said, I, I could like, you know, it's not hard for me just to go and like list out like, you know, 10 biz, 10 niches or 20 niches. But the point is, is that like, the niche will only be good or bad depending on you and your individual variables. I don't know those for you and your individual variables, so I can't tell you or bias you towards thinking that certain niches are good because of my authority. It's irresponsible. It needs to be your idea, okay? So that's how you select a niche. You need to get to it. Don't spend ages deciding. If it takes you more than like a, a day or two to pick a niche, then you're taking too long. So once, once you've selected your niche, we need to do some niche market research. Now, this is like the most unsexy thing you can do is research on your niche, but it's the most it's the most asymmetric activity that you have in your business. And by asymmetric, I mean like it. One hour of niche market research can make you more money than anything else you could possibly do in your business. Think about that. If you spend like ten hours doing niche market research, that will make you more money than ten hours doing sales calls. Right. And I'm not saying that you should just dedicate your entire life and time to niche market research, because there's obviously, you know, research can be a procrastination a lot of the time and pain avoidance. But if you don't, if you're not researching your niche and constantly learning more things about them and how they think and operate, you're putting yourself at a massive disadvantage. The truth is that the people who truly dominate niches are the people who truly understand them. And the people who truly understand them are the people that have researched them. Now, the best form of research is sales calls, right? So we've got this chicken and egg scenario where to get sales calls, you have to understand your niche and to understand your niche, you have to get sales calls. But you can you can, you can can use this program to generate sales calls without having a massive understanding of your niche. But I'm telling you now that like research your niche. It's not fun. It's a bit boring. It's not sexy. But here's the weird thing. If you're interested in your niche, you'll actually enjoy the research, right? So, you know, Go and watch the YouTube videos they'd watch. Go and engage in the, the social groups they'd engage in, right? Join the forums they'd join, right? Join clubs they'd join. Like, I, don't, I don't care. Join newsletters they'd join, right? All of these things that, like, that, that they do, you need to engulf your world and temporarily become your niche. Because I'm telling you, like, the easiest way to get an advantage and to become the best is to be your niche or to live as if you were for a, for a while, right? So the better you understand your niche, the easier client acquisition will be. The deeper you understand your niche, the better you are able to craft marketing stimuli that resonates with them and encourages them to take action. So when you create anything in your client acquisition process, all of your copy, all of your scripts, your ads, your videos, your funnels, everything that you build through this program needs to be built around the people that you want to become clients, right? You start with the niche in the market and you adapt everything in your business around those needs and those people and the intricacies of their psychology and situation. So when you can pick up on little details in the niche that other people in your competition can't pick up on, you can leverage those details in your marketing stimuli, in your appointment booking and sales stimuli, and it will give you just a ridiculous advantage. This is the, honestly, it's the main thing, right? It's like when it comes to building offers and stuff, we do a little bit more of this as we, as we move our way through the offer module. But as we move our way through the offer module, we're going to come back to the niche market research. So if you haven't done this, then you're not going to build a good offer and then you've you've kicked yourself in the foot before you've even began, right? I'm not sure if that's a saying, you've kicked yourself in the foot because quite literally that's impossible. <laughs> but you get the point, right? So the better you understand your niche, the easier it will be for you to craft a winning offer, which is in the next video. Offers account for 80% of client acquisition success. They're like the Pareto principles. Like, you know, people say that like, you know, 20% of, you know, your things account for 80% of your results. Like the offer is the 20% that accounts for 80%. I'm not even exaggerating here. So the truth is that niche market research drives 80% of your client acquisition results. I can't tell you, like, I'm gonna say it again. Research your niche, 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 all right? I, I, could, keep, I could do it a hundred times, but you probably get bored. I cannot 
stress the importance of this. It's not fun. It's not sexy. You're not, you've probably got some, you probably think, yeah, I already understand my niche. The truth is that if you understood your niche, you'd know exactly what to put in front of them to get them to buy, right? If you want to know how to write copy or how to write sales scripts, all you have to do is know what people want to read and what people want to experience. And the only way you do that is by stepping into their life, putting their shoes on, putting their hats on and actually seeing the world through the way that they see it. And then you can start to build all of your systems and acquisition systems around them, all right? You do not build, like, you do not build a niche around a client acquisition system. You build a client acquisition system around a niche. Everything I'm gonna teach you and everything we're gonna teach you throughout this entire program starts with the niche, with the people you're reaching out to. So I've compiled a list of questions to form a client avatar for your business. The better you can understand these questions with more accuracy and detail, the better your niche understanding and therefore advantage is going to be, right? So we've got the Imperium Client Avatar Worksheet here. Um, and like this is basically like a really simple um, document, right? So what I want you to do is basically like go down here and you know go to um, file and make a copy, right? And come all the way down like this. And I want you to make another sort of page here. And I want you to answer all of these questions, right? So what does your niche do? How do they spend their week? What do they do when they're not working? Where do they get their news? How do they, what do they make? How do they feel about their job? What are concerns in their life? What aspects of their personality or life um, affect how you market your product to them, right? What's their history? What happened in the past that led them to this point? How do they feel about that? Like, you know, all of these little questions, like, you need to like know them better than they know themselves. You want to be able to write a day in your niche's diary. And I can do that for agency owners and high ticket coaches. Like I can do it for gym owners, right? I could, and because of that, I can produce copy on scripts and funnels, like, and they just work. So an example of this, right? If I go to um, the funnel that we're using at the moment that we probably won't be using for easy growth, but this video, right, is, um, what is it? It's five minutes long, right? And I produced this um, introduction video in one take, right? We have booked, I think about 1,500 appointments through this funnel. And this was the first, we didn't even split test this video. I just, I recorded it without even thinking with no script in like a, in like a three to four to five minute period. It's the same thing with Bo. Bo built this funnel and we haven't changed anything about it since we launched it, right? Nothing has changed. We've left it pretty much identical except for adding some testimonials. And the reason we've been able to build like a, a banging funnel and a banging VSL video and like schedule thousands of appointments through this is because we understand the market, right? I know exactly what to say. Bo knows exactly what to type. And we only, we only know that stuff because we know what people need to hear and want to read, right? I know, like it's power. Like I know exactly what an agency owner or coach needs to see for them to make a decision to work with us. And so all I have to do it's figure that out and then put it in front of them and then I've got a client, right? That's really all client acquisition is. Like I made this video like, I don't know, like 18 months ago and it's still, we just left it because it's just it's just like banging out shit ton of video, um, shit ton of appointments, right? So that's the client avatar. This is something that you probably feel some resistance towards doing. You think, oh, like really, Charlie, I've got to do some niche market research. Like how basic is this? Like I just want the, the email copy and your fancy loom system and how you do YouTube videos. Like don't be an idiot. <laughs> I'm telling you that stuff will come and that stuff will help you. But this is the main thing because all of that stuff is built on this, right? So if you haven't done this and you don't intend on doing it, then I'm sorry to tell you that, you know, things aren't gonna work out very well for you in this program, okay? So make sure you do it. So if you're new to a niche, you won't have all the answers and here's how to get them, right? So if you can't fill this out, don't worry, right? Because, you know, if you've just picked a niche, you probably don't know anything about the niche and like how they live, right? That's fine. So like you need to learn. Now you don't need to spend the next like two to three weeks doing niche market research. You can continue to build your client acquisition system. But this avatar thing is something that should stay bookmarked on your laptop and you should constantly come back and try to improve it and add more and more things to it. Like I'd recommend starting a Google Drive and a spreadsheet and some docs. And every time you learn something new about your niche, add it, right? And over time, you want to build pages and pages and pages of information about your niche and how they operate until that becomes unconscious in your mind and you can use it at any given turn and make a shit ton of money, okay? It's like all of your acquisition is born out of understanding, right? And that's that. So if you, if you want to get the answers, you can call your niche and ask to interview them pretending to be a student at a local university or college. Like, like hey, I'm, I'm from the local college. 
Um, I'm doing like a, a some some research on gym owners and like how they live and stuff because I'm really interested in it. Would you mind if I interviewed you for like 10 minutes just for my essay? I won't reference your name, don't worry. Now you can do that or you can just be honest. You can say, look, trying to start a company with gym owners. I don't have anything to sell you, but what I'm really trying to do is like learn like learn the world of a gym owner. Um, I won't need more than 10 minutes. And if, if you provide me with some information, it's really useful. I'll give you this or I'll give you that. You can sort of think of a negotiation point, right? The other thing is just sales calls. The, 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 the reason that I understand my market so well is because I've done about 1,500 sales calls, right? That's my advantage. And also it helps that I've been the market, right? That's like the big one. But, you know, if you haven't got that luxury, like you need to do as many sales calls as you want, as you can possibly handle. And like, this is why like, even if you take a sales call and it's not qualified or it doesn't close, it's still infinitely valuable to your business because it helps you understand your niche more. Because remember, like a niche is like a fractal. So the problems and experiences and past and you know needs and desires of one individual in your niche is probably very representative or has a lot of affinity to the niche as a whole, right? So it's kind of like, you know, if I spoke to one gym owner and they told me they were struggling with this thing and it led them to feel like this, then that probably represents all of the gym owners out there with, you know, maybe that's not true exactly, but to a degree it is. And you also want to hang out where your niche hangs out. So online forums, groups, etc. just engulf yourself in the life of these people. Talk to as many as you can, ask as many questions as you can, and always be curious. So that's the niche video. I know it's not the sexiest topic. I know it's not the shiniest thing. It's not the most exciting. It's pretty basic. But it's imperative that you get this foundation right, because it doesn't matter how good you become at client acquisition. If... If the fundamentals of your of your business being your niche and your product are weak or, or poor, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard you row, it matters what boat you're in, right? So what we're doing here is just building a really fucking fast boat. So you need a niche if you want to win. It's not about how hard you row, it's about what boat you're in. So pick wisely because markets are dominated by specialists, okay? So in summary, we discussed functional roles and how you can liken this to biology. We discussed operational drag multipliers and how like just having one niche and one product improves the operational scalability of your company, which is the whole point, because there's no point in having clients if you can't keep them, right? We talked about the specialist advantage, um, the common mistakes people make being copycatting, worrying about competition or saturation. We talked about rowing the boat. Um, then we talked through the checklist and the niche market research. So, you know, don't take this video lightly. Make sure you do all the action items because we're gonna be picking up on them as we move through the next few videos. And once again, as per the last video, you need to watch every single video in this acquisition genesis module. It's taken me a long time to put together and I've put so much time into this. Not You shouldn't watch it because I put time into it, but the point is that I've put so much time into it because I know how important it is. I want to teach you to think. I want to teach you to reason and see the world in a way that allows you to be an absolute demon at client acquisition and the rest of your company. And I'm really excited for it. So be sure to watch every single video in acquisition genesis because if you don't you're going to have huge paradigm or you're going to have blind spots you're going to have paradigm or flaws that prevent you from growing right so make sure you watch all the videos i hope you enjoyed this one please do the action items and i will look forward to seeing you in the next video thanks for watching